Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to another episode of A Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. As you know, likeable science is all about science that is meaningful, relevant to all of our lives, why we should pay attention to science, why we should care about science and support science. Today, we're gonna to be dealing with a subject that, that really gets right in that, in that beautiful interface. We're gonna be talking about addiction, drug abuse, and the work that's being done to help people deal with those issues. And we have Alan Johnson, the president and CEO of Hinamauka. Oh, thank Welcome. You. Oh, thank you, and we appreciate this opportunity. Thank oh, you. yeah, no, very glad to have you here. This is, you know, it's a big growing problem, right? Uh, there, there are more people now in need of, we're misusing drugs, certainly, and more addictions to more, com and more compounds coming up all the time, right? That are well, yeah, yeah. You know, part of the reform that we did, you know, when we did it in our state, we were doing the reform. Is we said, okay, we have to look at chronic illnesses and what the impacts are. And we, like many other states, began looking at, okay, we're treating addiction, but what about misuse? Mm -hmm. And then, oh my God, the, that's when the government came out two years ago and said, 93 million people have a misuse or addiction problem. It's almost 30% of our nation uh -huh. if you count prescription drugs and alcohol. Uh -huh. And we said, oh my God, and they don't get any treatment if you're misusing. So this really opened our eyes. This is sort of like a continuum. There are people who yeah. don't use at all, there are people who use a little bit, and the, very sensible, yeah. there are people who sort of misuse, and then there are people who abuse and, and or get addicted. Yeah, that's basically. right, so we're not talking about moderation, right. but we're saying, hey, if you're misusing, you're doing it to the extent that you're hurting your brain right. and hurting your organs and that's 30% of our population. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we said, uh, and they tabulated that it was uh, half a trillion dollars a year going to our healthcare, and that's without really knowing all the yeah, information. That, that, and that's not taking account of the, you know, the personal suffering and the, the problems with all your fam friends and family, trying to help you out and deal with these people, right? And yeah, now we know it affects your emotions, yeah. affects your social interactions, yeah, yeah. but also affects your health and uh, how you, well your brain operates. So, a lot of suffering that's going on, and by extension to the family too. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a funny interface between uh, sort of personal choice, medical help, and the legal system, right? I mean, all three yeah. of these groups sort of well uh, interface I, on. I, I think that there's, you know, at least from the federal government, they're saying we, you know, we messed up, you know, mm -hmm. you know, because we're so fragmented that our criminal justice solutions involving shame and punishment, maybe. You know, if you are a safety issue, yes, but if you're not, maybe that wasn't our best choice. Right. And how do, could we get medical, physical medical, talk to behavioral mm -hmm. health? And that wasn't happening. As we get them together, we go, we've got great technology, we've got great solutions. Yeah. Yeah. We're just not really working together and implementing them. Yeah, no, but that's interesting how the, that middle ground that misuse is being recognized. And, and again, this is sort of like the trend in medicine in general these days, right? It's better, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? You're far better sort of stopping the problem before it gets to be too severe, right? Well, I, what we found out is why we were tasked with looking at chronic illness. We found out in, in the United States that 5% of the people cost 50% of the cost, and we're the most expensive in the world sure. per person, with the lowest outcomes of all the advanced nations. Uh -huh. And a large part of it is that, hey, we have, we're not taking care of people when they first get sick. Now, half the population we do, but the other half we don't. Right. And when they say, if we were to take care of everybody, that's way cheaper than not taking care of you and then take care of it with all our wonderful technology that's yeah. very expensive. Yes, yeah, so that, that book yeah. came out from Pearl's book, uh, Mistreated, recently, that, that, mm -hmm. that really lays out the whole case on, on how, how badly our medical system as a whole is doing, basically. It's, we sort of face this perfect storm of weird insurance laws and... Oh, the, our systems yeah. are broken, but yeah. we undoubtedly have the best medicine in the world, right. the best doctors and right. even the best behavioral specialists, but how we do it, right. how we work together, not too good. Right. <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we don't have the outcomes to show for it, for sure. Yeah. Excellent. So, so let's, 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 be, let's be sure we get some terms down here. So, yeah. so addiction is... I mean, how do you define addiction? Uh, addiction, you know, uh, you know, by the, the medical field is designed as a chronic relapse in disease, mm -hmm. like heart disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. But with addiction is that you have an obsessive compulsive need to seek and use drugs, even if there's negative consequences, even mm -hmm. if it harms you, you would still obsessively do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so something like this can become very, very harmful for you. You're losing a lot of control. It's uncontrollable and parts of your brain are not functioning, so you lose control. Right, yeah, your it's whole a, uh, risk reward system gets thrown yeah. really out of whack. And, yeah. and rather whack, and also you have structural changes in your brain, right. chemical changes that uh, you know become dysfunctional in those brain, and so when you need them most they're not there to help you. In fact, they hurt you. They work against you. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, on a misuse, you would, and the difference of addiction is it's treatable and preventable, 
But if left on, you know, it's going to not end good. Right. So on the misuse, you know, you're losing a little bit of that control, mm -hmm. but you're still keeping some of the control. Mm -hmm. So the answer for you would be slow down. Mm -hmm. Where addiction is, you can't, you have to stop. You mm -hmm. can't ever use again. But you could slow down, but maybe you need a little help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're losing some control, and do you know that? Mm -hmm. We think people don't really know that. Right, right. People, particularly people who are getting these their drugs legally, right? And, mm -hmm. Like, how, how can I be out of control? I, I'm continuing to refill my prescriptions using as well, it's prescribed. But, well, well. The, the, the case in point is the opioid crisis, right. that every state, 50 state has a crisis of overprescribing, like right. 700,000 prescriptions here in Hawaii, right. with 30 percent of the people using them. But And we have 66,000 people on the mainland dying from it. Yeah. But it's the it's the 50-year-olds and 40-year-olds right. that started, you know, opioids. We never th would think, we thought you start young, and here you're starting later. And then we find, oh my God, it's really too much for you, and you didn't understand right. that you, you have a predisposition to addiction. Which right. most people do. Yeah, and that, that gets us into the next thing I want to talk about. Well, yeah. are there ways to, to look at the factors that, you know, people who, who's really at risk? Can you tell sort of in advance before people ever start dealing with, with uh, using drugs who's, who's at risk for addiction? Or is there, is there really, are there, are there lifestyle indicators? Are there uh, tests to do any of that stuff? Yes, yeah, there's what they call protective and risk factors. But we now know the genes are about 50% of the okay. issue. And the issue is that we know a lot about genetics and we know a lot about the chemical reactions in the brain, but we don't know exactly on the genes for, you know, why about 25% of the people are gonna say, you know, I don't like drinking. It mm -hmm. just doesn't do much for me. And 25% of the people go, this is the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> and then about 50% of us are in between. We kind of like it, but is it worth the hangover and how much times? And so we manage it. So we don't know why that is that there's those people. If we did, we think we could do a lot. Right. But protective risk factors are, it has been geared towards the kids because usually you started as a teenager. Only recently is it middle class starting at 50 with opioids. Yeah, but, you, you showed in a, mm -hmm. when you were at a Rotary group, you showed a, a slide that, that showed that big a big sort of midlife bulge in, in opioid use with, with a 50 to 40 to 60 year old is basically being mm. a huge percentage of the, the people who are really in trouble with it. Yeah, so before we would say uh, if you're 50 years old, we didn't really see in treatment because you probably started as a teenager or young 20s. You didn't live till you're 50. Right. Not very many people did. All of a sudden, we're overwhelmed with all these 50 year olds coming in that said right. illness, injury. Right. And now I have an addiction I can't stop. Uh, yeah. Help me. Yeah, yeah. It's. Mm. it's so, and it's it's all too easy to do too, right? You you get you get yes, you break a, a limb or get a bad sprain or whatever. And the companies who manufacture these opioids, in particular, have been quite aggressive about marketing them to doctors, right? And yeah, I mean, and not always forthcoming or honest right. either. But uh, that's true. Is that uh, hey, look, it's really good for acute pain, mm -hmm. but it's dangerous for chronic pain where you use it over a long period right. of time. And in fact, it can increase your sensitivity to pain. Right. You know, and your doctor has to make that call whether that's worth it or not. But you can end up into an addiction easy. Right. Yeah. And, and it's very sophisticated people drug. People lie to their doctors all the time. Uh -huh. Well, the doctor shopping gets pretty common. Right. You know, getting something from your dentist, getting from, and then you're getting from different doctors, and then of course you're getting from your friends and family who say, right. oh, "I'm 50. I'm working. Could right. you help me open right. up your medicine cabinet? We all got that little stash sure. for you know emergency <laughs> use. Emergency yeah. use when I'm going to need it the most. Yeah. Okay, you can have it. Sure. And right. So all of that leads to okay. Then I need more and where do I get it? Right, and they start mixing drugs in and then if they can't get more of the legal yeah. stuff, they go to other routes. And, yeah, the, yeah. You know, methamphetamine is really spiked right. here in our Hawaii. We haven't got, we've got some heroin increase, but not like the mainland to get huge heroin and fentanyl, but it looks like methamphetamine, they're turning to methamphetamine a lot of folks, mm -hmm. but a lot of them are just heavily using alcohol and mm -hmm. uh, prescription pains, right. not a good combination. Right. And then, you know, you get, I mean, you get also these people who are in very diverse life circumstances, right? Some people who are just sort of slid into it very accidentally from, you know, they're yeah, sort of a working person. They've, they've been good all their life, basically, never been in trouble, and, and suddenly they're, they're in this spot. But you get other people, too, who have been, you know, for various reasons, you know, vagrants out on the street, homeless, in trouble, on and off, and they, and they start using particularly some of the things like the methamphetamine, right? And they, they get, uh, I mean, oftentimes it seems people speak of them going sort of psychotic. That's true, but the majority of people probably start with something less you know, intensive, and usually it's, they say half are because they want to feel good. And so if you're talking about misuse, it's alcohol and prescription mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where they start. And if you're a kid, 
it's marijuana. Today, it's mm -hmm. really huge problems with marijuana with kids, and they're having troubles with it. So those two, they start there. Mm -hmm. And they say half use it to feel good, and half use it to feel better. So traumas, things not working well at home, puberty, grief, mm -hmm. moving, bullying, all that type of stuff, it takes away those feelings. The other half are saying, oh, this feels really good, let's do more of it. Mm -hmm. so, so those are kind of the two approaches that yeah, come at it. Yeah. So it's about 50-50, so <laughs> then it leads to bad cases if you don't manage it well. Right, right. Yeah. And then w and when you get addiction, you can't manage it at all, it's unmanageable. Yeah. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's low morale, or, you know, what's your morality, what's your willpower? Right. It's not, you know, uh -huh. once you reach a, d a disease, brain disease, it's uncontrollable. Right, right, yeah, your, your brain is sending you signals saying, you know, give me more of this, give me more of this, and you know, even when it's uh, having very bad effects physiologically on, on you, on your whole body, on your brain, on the, your life, right? Yeah, we like to say that, you know, hey, if you're starting off, you're getting kind of a whisper to use more, and all of a sudden it turns to a loud voice, and when you get addiction, it's somebody with a bullhorn screaming in your ear, and there's nothing you can do but hear that pounding, driving, screaming. Mm -hmm. You know, people who get a whisper, they don't understand the pounding, driving, screaming, and that all you can do is try to take care of that. Right, yeah, yeah. It becomes sort of an, an urgency to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I must deal with this in the moment right now because that's the only thing that matters to me. Yeah, and we do know that a brain that stops working with, you know, besides the reward functions of it that wants you to do it, it's uh, how you deal with stress and it, and it creates anxiety. Right. But it's also cognitive understanding. You don't know how to analyze, evaluate, and solve problems and you lose your impulse control. You can't control your behaviors, and you can't control your emotions. So you put lack of, you know, your judgment's impaired, you put all that together, you're in trouble. Yeah, so again, it sounds like, as with so many things, uh, we should probably be doing much more on the early end, educating kids about that, and helping kids understand their own thought processes, so how they, how they think when they get impulses to do something, how they should you know, evaluate those impulses before acting on them, right? And yeah, I think that, and, that's, and so, you know, that area is there in the adolescent brain does not develop very good. How right. do you analyze and, right. and impulse control? The other parts are working, but that part doesn't work. Yeah. And I think we need to get the message to them that if you start using marijuana or alcohol, uh, you may arrest the development of your brain and you may never get it back. So if you're, you know, alcohol or marijuana as an adult, especially marijuana, you're going to get it all back if you, you know, over some years but maybe not as a kid. So we got to get better messages out there. Yeah, yeah, the, the prefrontal lobes of the brain where you're yeah. really, which really are cortex, the, for the judgment, yeah, that's, that's the last part of the brain to develop, oftentimes yeah. not into the late teens and into the and, and 20s. You, yeah, you're all right? to yeah. 23, they're saying. Yeah, yeah very good, yes. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, so those impairments. We got to get that message out there to the kids. Yeah. So this, you know, the fourteen-year-olds, the twelve-year-olds, don't yeah. start, you know, and understand this is probably something I need to be should be very cautious yeah. about. And, and we don't want to have scare messages. We don't want to say we're talking about occasional once in a while use. You know, we're talking about you know how much is too much. Right. You know, and then you're doing. But surprisingly, how much is too much is not very much. Yeah, and of course that's been the, the whole issue with marijuana, right? It used to be when back in the day, yeah. uh, a, a low percentage of THC, what, ten percent, five percent? I mean, yeah. it was really low, and now they've got stuff with just phenomenal. Oh, man, they say it's like three hundred times more powerful yeah. if you get the, the high grade yeah. stuff. That, oh, that's you know, before we'd say we didn't see addiction on marijuana, yeah. Yeah. but now it's the third leading addiction in Hawaii yeah. for adults. It's, really? You know, meth, alcohol, and then marijuana. Yeah. Those are the big three, wow. okay. and so people are coming forward, and we're shocked, like, oh, why? You know, but it's been for about 10 years. It's mm -hmm. really surprising. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've talked about the sort of the, mm -hmm. the downsides of this and how it, how it all occurs. When we come back, but we're going to take a short break first, we're okay. going to look at sort of the upside, what, what you guys at Hinamalka are doing, what, what you found, what the evidence for, that it works for is and all that. But we'll do that after the brief break here. When we come back, you're on Likeable Science with Alan Johnson. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. And welcome to Likeable Science, back to Likeable Science, I should say. Here we're talking 
uh, here on Think Tech Hawaii with Alan Johnson, the CEO and president of Hinamauka, a recovery center, I guess I call, you call it. Yes. Sir. And uh, we've been talking, we spent the first half of the show sort of discussing what addiction was, how people fall into it, the different sort of paths they fall into, the, the dangers of it, the damages it can do. Yeah. But your business is really all about helping people who have gone into it addictive or now even working with people who are just misusing as we were talking about, right? I know, it, it seems like a dark subject, but we're about hope and opportunity. Yeah, so yeah, okay. positive messages are saying, hey, you know, it is treatable. You so know, there's not curable if yeah. you have addiction, but misuse is you could slow down, mm -hmm. but on, uh, on addiction is treatable and we can work with you and you can have a wonderful life, maybe not using, right. but a, a life of abstinence, but it really can do help. So, so what are the basic principles of, of your treatment? What are the sort of underlying well, ideas? You know, it, it depends on the continuum you spoke about. If you're misusing, you're gonna get a lot of motivational type work. If you're, uh, now you're going too far and you need short term, now you need the beginning stages of addiction, you're gonna get this you know, outpatient, but then if you're getting really serious, you need residential, you probably have comorbidity issues, diabetes, depression, and you gotta treat the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be removed from your environment because you gotta relearn all those things. So what happened is you lose your memory, so you learn, how, you don't know how to do social skills anymore, you don't know how to do evaluation and decision making anymore, mm -hmm. you gotta relearn that. So mm -hmm. the, re the, the research, brain research, really helped us to improve our therapies because now we're focusing on changes in attitudes, and behaviors and coping skills and how do you address triggers mm -hmm. role modeling that so there's right. a lot a lot of work like that yeah because the, the, this whole triggering business is really bad right I mean, somebody may be doing okay and then something happens they either see a bottle of their favorite booze or mm -hmm. smell that you know a smell of uh, you know good marijuana or whatever and, and once you get to the addiction, these yeah. cravings, uh, you stop using. Those cravings go on for years. Yeah, yeah. You know, years and years. So they diminish, but sometimes they go away and they come back really strong and then go away, but come back less strong. So you need this support system, but you need these coping skills, how to do it, and you need a practice to relearn your, okay, here's how I problem solve, but here's how I cope if, I, if something triggers those cravings again, and you understand it's a short duration. So a lot yeah. of that happens. Yeah, again, this is sort of getting back to what I was saying earlier about, about you really need to educate, you know, we should be educating kids from a fairly young age about being aware of how they think and what's going on in their brains in terms of when you feel this way, like sort of step back for a moment and think, you know, why am I, why am I feeling like I should go out and do this? You yeah, know, you know, what, you know what's, keeping that decision making yeah, going so what, you don't what become, you know, have no control over your impulses. Yeah. And also the other part is the emotions. You lose the touch over control of your emotions so we want to help you deal with your emotions in positive ways and begin to learn how to process your emotions. So you go to school, you don't learn that. Mm -hmm. You don't learn, you know, grandma died, how do I deal with that? You don't learn any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some, you know, I changed schools and one kid does that well and the other kid doesn't. How are you processing that and what kind of support systems do they have? Yeah, and schools typically don't teach a lot of emotional mm -hmm. Uh, emotional management. Yeah, yeah, emotional management. And people yeah. learn very different things, different families, family backgrounds give very different messages about yeah, that, right? Culture and ethnicity, right. all that has a different way of expressing. Right. So maybe not trying to change that, but how within your culture would you do a healthy expression of working with your emotions right. that comes out in a good way that helps you, not hinders you? Right. And we're, we're not very good at that. No. And so we, do, we, we often end up hindering, not helping. Sure, sure, because mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't just ignore the emotion and, and suppress it and not express it. Suppressing but, is the worst. Right, you know. but, but expressing it really badly <laughs> right. might not work out too right. good for you. <laughs> got, you have to find that happy right. medium yeah. you know, where you've yeah. expressed enough that people can mm. see and hear your pain, your frustration, what, what have you, right? Yeah, so a lot of the things you would learn in treatment I think would have been great for anybody to learn. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, because you're really developing those things to a little higher degree of all your cognitive ability, right. your how to deal with stress, your reward system, right. all that is really valuable. And again, you suspect if you taught this to five and six-year-old kids, they'd really learn it in a fundamentally, yeah. it integrate it in their brains in a much better way. You know? well, we could. Yeah. For one of the things we're trying to do to make it better, is we're trying to say, let's get behavioral health into primary care. Yeah. You know, you go see your family doctor, it's their behavioral specialist in the room. Mm -hmm. So you need a little bit of motivation. So there's some great motivational techniques. I mean, doctors tend to say, well, lose weight or slow down on the drinking. Mm -hmm. We know that it helps a little bit, but for most people, not too good. Right. But if they learn motivational techniques, they could do something more. And then we also love the idea that, hey, if you do need more, then you come back to the doctor who stays with you. It's a relapsing disease. So mm -hmm. you're slipping, maybe you, if you need a little 
little more, you come see us for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, outpatient mm -hmm. a couple of times, and then if you need us again, we're there, and then if you get too carried away, well, then you're going to need us for our outpatient or residential. But, uh, so I think that's a great new way. That's why the United States is developing those plans right now to do that. Yeah, because we've had this very fragmented medical system. Um, I mean, it was driven home to me years ago when I switched jobs and had to, essentially had to then switch doctors. And it's like, why should I have to switch my doctor just because I switched my job? I mean, yeah. oh, and I just all of that. spent two years developing a relationship with this doctor. I finally knew yeah. them, I trusted them, I, I liked them. They knew me. They we knew do what, lose and, that by switching, yeah, you know, unless there's a good reason right. where you think you know you need something different. But but uh, being with somebody and then having that network of people who are working with you makes a big difference. And yeah. if a behavioral health specialist is part of that, yeah. greatly. And you can use these motivational techniques for diabetes, for mm -hmm. hypertension. All you know, you could really make. That's where you make the changes. Motivate people to change. Right, to change the behaviors. It are, would really improve primary care. Yeah. And then we would like primary care to deal with more chronically ill things and not the less minor things. People with less licensure could do with that. So that's what they're doing in other countries that have been really phenomenal. And we think, you know, that's the next step for us here in the United States. Excellent. So, so they're, they're getting a whole sort of behavioral health uh, workforce uh, that, that really focuses on this kind yeah, of so thing. Yeah, so that we talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and we share the treatment plan. Yeah. You know, because if, if you're in treatment, we want to know if you're a diabetic or you've got this major heart condition. Right. And kind of, how do we help you if you're in residential? Now we're, we're saying, hey, look, we need payment reform. We need a doctor on site so that we can handle more complex patients in a nurse, not a hospital, but a little investment in us, and we've already had pilot projects, we can make a phenomenal difference on outcomes mm -hmm. and keep people out of going to the hospitals, which is where all your cost is. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. Somebody checks into a hospital for a day, and mm -hmm. phew, there's thousands of dollars, typically, I, right? And we have this few number of people, but a large number of them are going to the hospital all the time. Yeah, yeah, repeatedly. And, and repeatedly, and it's millions of dollars. Yeah. And, I mean, we spend about nine billion here in healthcare in Hawaii, and they say five percent of the people are doing it. If that's true, right. that percentage that means about four and a half billion a year we're spending here right. in to, Hawaii to, to treat, for to treat the few people who are ex, didn't get treatment when they had right. the onset of a, yeah. of a chronic illness. Uh, who, yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, some investment and in some good ideas really could save a lot of suffering and a lot of money. Yeah, and we we, we really need to do that. And, you know we we. We see that in, in other things besides the health system, too. So in, in a lot of European countries, for instance, in, in K-12 schooling, the teacher will move along with a group of kids for three or four or five years. You'll have the same teacher again and again. And it's great. It saves a lot of time each year not having to sort of learn the rules again, right? You know as a student what you can and can't get away with. You know what, what is and is not expected of you. The teacher doesn't have to like learn new, new names, new personalities, right? They're just watching you grow and working with you. And they get some really good outcomes from that. You know? Yeah, I think we could learn a lot from the uh, European countries and, and also, you know, Japan and mm -hmm. some of the others. The, we, the, the thing is, what we've been very good is we've been uh, comparing ourselves to other states. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not as bad as that state. And I think we, when we were the best, that was a good idea. <laughs> Who is the best of the states? But now that we're in last place, why are we saying I'm better than my teammate right. who's worse than me, but we're all in last place? Yeah, yeah. And so, and we have the best medicine right. and the best technology. We yeah. could take some of their ideas and we could do phenomenally better. Yeah. I mean, we could skyrocket back to the best if we just plan better. Right, uh, but it's, it's a, it's a very large scale, very sort of system-wide problem. Uh, yeah. It's a problem that there's a lot of different factors of economics, sort of bus the business models that are currently being used, the, mm -hmm. the academic structures, the, the, the in medical insurance companies, of course, are a big part of it. Yeah. Uh, all these things are right now locked into a sort of a pattern, right? And, and you can't yeah. change one of them. Well, we began here in Hawaii recently by having all these task forces, and I must be on seven task forces now, and I'm glad to be invited to them and with hospitals and insurances and other providers and government. And, you know, for the first time, we're talking to each other. There's a great deal of hope on that. I, yeah. My complaint is we moved too slow. Uh, but, you know, we need some activism and more people mm -hmm. saying, let's do it. But uh, it's a good start. Excellent, excellent. No, that, that, that is a hopeful, a hopeful uh, uh, trend. So uh, when you see an individual patient, I mean, how do you sort of, uh, how do you define success for them? No? Well, uh, it's a chronic relapsing disease, so you know it's, it's not uncommon that you come and you know do you complete treatment and are you absent when you leave treatment? We talk to these coping skills. How are you a couple of months later? Mm -hmm. And so we're just learning that now with support from the federal government to help us change. You know, it's funding, mm -hmm. and so they're saying, well, maybe you should be a case manager. We try to connect you with the primary care doctor so that we know if you're relapsing, we catch you. So it's a little bit more not 
you're out there for a long time and you come back for a lot more. Right. So that's beginning to happen. But so we do have follow-ups for six months, but it's self-report. Mm -hmm. But we are going for, by having a doctor and a nurse and we're talking to each other, we went from about 50% completing residential to about 75% completing. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Now, how many are still there six months? We think a chronic relapsing, they, they're not getting that follow-up. Mm -hmm. We called you six months and go, how are you doing? Right. What did we do for six months? Nothing. Right. So, you know, if so. You them in a good moment, they yeah. sound fine. If you catch them in a bad moment. Oh, you're right. really good, even though last week you weren't too good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or this week you are good, but right. you were great for six months. Yeah. But, so, uh, so that has to improve. So some case management is happening now that we're, we have some expertise mm -hmm. on that. So that's just at the beginning stages of developing. That's great that, that as, a, as a sort of a, a therapeutic specialty, you're, you're learning about yourselves, you're learning about better ways to, to manage your own businesses as it were, to make your make your treatment more effective and, and more helpful to people. Well, it's kind of like saying, hey, we got all the stigma out here and we got the shame and punishment, mm -hmm. now let's call it a medical issue, and that it's treatable as a medical issue. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you would do that, how would you do that better? Yeah. And that could lead us to a lot better solutions. Yeah, I mean, if you look at really the old mm -hmm. model where, mm -hmm. where uh, a lot of illicit drug use was treated strictly as a legal problem more than a medical problem, yeah. there was a very weird situation where you had the police on the one side saying, let's, let's enforce this law more tightly, and the organized crime saying, yes, let's keep this all enforced tightly so we can keep our monopoly yeah. on things. <laughs> and it's like, well, the police and organized crime are on the same side. There's something wrong with how, how we're well, handling this. I know? do like that, the, you know, one, the police need to keep us safe no matter what. Right, you know, you're, if you're misbehaving, and, and they do you're, good job and, but we could take away your drug addiction and you would stop misbehaving, we always say, you're not really a criminal, you're doing criminal because of your drug addiction, mm -hmm. versus a criminal who is, has a drug addiction and you take away their drug addiction, now you have a sober criminal. I right. mean, those are two different people. Right. But for the the police are recognizing that those who have a drug addiction, they're reaching out more. They, their safety is their priority. Yeah, absolutely. But they're reaching out to us to say, can you help us more? Yeah. And so we That's began right. those talks in this, in the, just in the last year. So we see them as being, look, we, we know we can't arrest ourselves out of this. We need you. You know, that's really refreshing to be, we're at the same table, because before we would be at the table and disagree, huh. and now we're kind of agreeing. Excellent, excellent. That's, that's really valuable, because yeah, you've got that, that again, it's a sort of the systemic view of, of it, and let's, let's get this person, let's get them in help. Excellent. Hey, well, this has been great fun and very informative. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure all of our viewers out there have, have learned a lot, too. Uh, Alan Johnson, the CEO of Hinamauka Recovery Center, and people I'm sure can just uh, Google Hinamalka. Yeah. Hinamalka.org, and we do have walk-in clinics where you just show up between 9 and 2, and we'll help you right there, screening assessments. So cool. please come and uh, see us. And we have multiple sites, and have 20-some sites, so we're all over. Excellent. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, well, th thank you for being here, and uh, I look forward to your continued success. And I hope you will come back and join us uh, next week for another episode of Likeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii.